let's get started. So I want to talk in the next one and a half, two hours or so about Parallel I.O. and what we did in the last couple of years uh, um, in the OMPIO project. And basically, the outline of my talk, I want to bring in basically three main aspects. One is talk about MPI.io and concepts of MPI.io first, um, basically to set a stage for a couple of things that we present uh, we did afterwards. Uh, the second part basically will focus on uh, our actual implementation of MPI.io that we recently added to the OpenMPI uh, trunk and to the 1.7 series. And in the third part, basically, I'll uh, talk about a couple of research aspects that we uh, did in OpenMPI IO uh, within the OpenMPI framework, but also one or two projects that were slightly outside that didn't make it yet into the OpenMPI trunk. So just a very brief motivation why IO is important. Um, there were a couple of interesting studies over the last couple of years, one performed by Lawrence uh, Livermore National Labs in 2005 where they estimated that basically for their applications, they need roughly one gigabyte per second I.O. bandwidth per teraflop of compute capability. Uh, and basically, what, they also, what their study also indicates is that write is significantly more important for them than read operations, simply because checkpointing, et cetera, uh, dominates, or they have five times more write operations than read operations. Now, just to set the stage, where are we right now? Uh, some of the largest I.O. installations that I'm aware of uh, are, for example, for the K-Computer in Japan. That was uh, number one, I think, the last time, but it's not anymore. Um, they have roughly 11 petaflops of compute capability, and their storage system is fairly large, with 864 I.O. nodes, more or less, or ob object storage targets in Lustra, but they only achieve a bandwidth of 96 gigabytes per second. So if you use the Lawrence Livermore estimate of one gigabyte per second I.O. performance per teraflop compute capability, they are an order of magnitude off. Yeah. And, and every other system that I'm aware of has the same problem. Yeah. So the numbers for Jaguar are, are slightly outdated. They are from 2010. I know that their machines are right now significantly larger, but the, the storage system itself is roughly still uh, in the same ability. So bottom line is basically uh, is that the I.O performance has not kept up with the compute performance, in, in my personal opinion, and that makes it a really challenging uh, topic for high performance computing for probably any compute intensive applications uh, at all. Um, so from the applicationers perspective, looking at parallel applications, the question is what they can actually, what can they actually do? Well, historically, many MPI applications, what they did was what I refer to as sequential I.O., namely that you have one process performing I.O. operations and everybody else just communicates with that process uh, to dump data to disk or to read data from disk. Uh, what you get in that case basically is a serialized execution of the I.O. operations, which is good from the sequential consistency perspective. It's, however, fairly bad from the performance perspective, simply because what you see over here, let, let me enable my pointer for a second. What you see over here is basically a vampire trace shot of what ha happens on the application perspective. Everything that is read over here is actually processes just waiting in communication operations with the single process that does perform I.O. While process zero, the green bar, is super busy doing everything and everybody else just waits. So um, it leads to basically significant load imbalances. It does not utilize I.O. systems efficiently. Um, it has not been used in the last couple of years as much as it was like in the 90s. Second approach, individual I.O. Every process has its own file that it operates on. Um, that works typically well from the performance perspective. It has, however, at least for parallel I.O., uh, for MPI-style parallel I.O. operations, two problems. One, the fact that if you are using tens of thousands of processes nowadays, basically overloads the metadata server. Yeah, I mean, um, metadata servers of parallel file systems do not really like to have tens of thousands of I.O. Of, of open and close operations going on at the same time. And I know, for example, at Oak Ridge, that was one of the main problems that they had with their main storage server on how to throttle processes actually opening and closing files at a given point in time. Uh, more importantly, from my perspective at least, because you could argue this is an 
implementation shortcoming, shortcoming of the parallel file systems and it could be resolved sooner or later. More importantly, however, in my point of view is um, if you have pro each process reading or producing an input file per, uh, per, per process, unless you are continuing with the same number of processes, very often you have the problem of, all right, I have now 10,000 output files, I need to somehow merge them to a single output file and split them up again for whatever the next simulation requires on the number of processes. So you are, to a certain extent, not solving the I.O. problem, you are postponing the I.O. problem. You are taking it offline from the view of that particular application, but you are not actually uh, resolving the issue. So. Um, it is still a, a solution and it's commonly used, especially if, if basically the output files can be utilized later on in the independently. From the MPI perspective, it is however not a proper solution in, in my personal opinion. Now, parallel IO itself, um, or what I refer to uh, as parallel IO in that context, is basically every process or all processes operate on the same file. Um, on different parts of the same file, but on the same file from the logical perspective. And the big challenge that, that comes in at, uh, at that point is really how to do that efficiently and how to do that such that you have a consistent output. And so to set the stage, this is really what MPI IO tackles. You have n processes trying to access the same file, uh, probably different parts of the same file or in the most uh, generic sense, the, uh, different parts of the same file, but how can you achieve that now in a performant manner? And this is really what MPI IO tackles. Um, so IO has been introduced in version two of MPI. Um, it is now also part of version three, although the modifications, I think there are, actually I'm not even aware of a modification of, of uh, MPI IO in version three compared to version two. But just to highlight a couple of things, uh, what really make MPI IO different compared to, uh, let's say, POSIX IO or most other IO APIs that I'm aware of, are things like the notion of group IO operations, or what they refer to as collective IO operations. Uh, I'll discuss them. Uh, in the, I, I discuss actually all of these points in more details in the next couple of minutes. Uh, the notion of a file view, which basically allows you to register an access plan to the file in advance. So basically, you are telling the system what you intend to do with that file. Uh, the notion of hints, basically that you can indicate to the I.O. library what your, pla what your plans are in terms of not which part of the file you are accessing, but from the perspective of, uh, of are you planning to access the file like in its contiguity, are you having random access, etc. So you can give a couple of hints to the I.O. library on how you intend to utilize the file. Uh, very important probably from the performance pers perspective also is the notion of the relaxed consistency semantics that MPI introduces. Now, if you read literature on relaxed consistency semantics, there are books filled with that topic. Uh, within the context of MPI, what they truly mean is that if you modify a file, that modification might initially only be visible at the process that performed the modification. They do not give a guarantee on that modification being immediately visible at another process. And last but not least, non-blocking I.O., asynchronous I.O. operations. Um, I will not talk too much about that, but at least for individual I.O. operations where a single process reads or writes, that has been implemented. It has shown partially very good results. Uh, I'll talk about non-blocking collective I.O. operations a bit in the very final part of my talk, which is more a research aspect. Now, Clearly, I, I will not give a, a, a complete MPI I.O. programming tutorial that's, I think, outside of the scope. But I'll show every now and then a uh, couple of interfaces of uh, how MPI operates with files. And the first one, really probably the most important from, from that perspective, is whenever you open a file, uh, MPI defines that to be a collective operation. So every process that participates in, the commu in a communicator uh, has to participate in the file open. And they have to provide some of the arguments, uh, the same arguments such as file name and uh, the access mode. Um, you see, by the way, over here also the argument info, which is the MPI annotation for hints or the MPI mechanism for hints. And basically, you receive a file handle back. Um, 
Everything else is very similar to what you are used to POSIX.io in terms of access mode. You have read, write, read only, write only, etc. Um, but basically, the fact that it's a collective operation is what really distinguishes it from uh, its uh, POSIX counterparts. Now, let's talk a bit about the file view. So what is the file view? As I mentioned, uh, basically, it's an access plan where you can tell the IU library which parts of the file you plan to access. Um, processes can share the same file view. In fact, the default file view, whenever you open a file, is defined such that every process sees the entire file. Um, now, however, if you register a file view, and in this example over here, for example, we have process 0 accessing the first block, process 1 the second block, 2 the third block, 4 the fourth block, etc., before process 1 accesses, uh, or process 0 accesses the fifth block again. Um, so if you decide to register such a file view, process 0 literally has no way how to access the parts that are not part of his file view. Okay? So you are basically restricting what parts of the file you can access. Do all, do all the blocks have to be the same size? No, they don't. They can be different. And uh, in fact, uh, the fact that you are setting a file view does not mean that you cannot change it. Just bef once you set it, until you change the file view, basically that's the part of the files that you can access. Uh, file views can overlap or can be disjoint. For write operations, they are not allowed to overlap, however. Um, you, as I mentioned, you can change them at runtime. And uh, very nicely, by the way, also is you have the option of skipping a part of the file. Like if you have something like a header that everybody needs to read, but then you want to skip it uh, in your description, basically uh, the file view mechanism allows you to do that. Uh, so by the way, what, what are the optimizations that you can base on, 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 on a file view? Well, you can pre-calculate very often where you need to put a particular portion of your data. That, uh, so a couple of those calculations you can do in advance. I'll show a number of things that we did based on a file view, such as uh, working on process placement optimizations. If you know who tries to access neighboring regions in the file, you can think about how can you combine their data more efficiently if they are close to each other. Um, for read operations, you could uh, actually think of like uh, prefetching data items based on a file view. Um, and so on. So there are a number of things that you can do. In my personal opinion, uh, implementers have not used that feature to the fullest, fullest extent yet. Okay. Now, just to dive a little deeper also into the details of the file view notion. So basically, the way MPI IO defines a file view is that you, that is a, it's a sequence of elementary types. And the name is misleading. The elementary type does not have to be an elementary basic MPI data type. It can be a derived data type. It can be any complex data structure. But basically, what you need to do is you need to, your file view need to consist of a series of these elementary types. That can be sometimes a bit of a challenge in terms of if your, date, if your file contains multiple types of data. But most of the time, I'm, what, what I've seen at least is people usually separate different types of data into different, different files. So if you have a mesh that describes your overall, I don't know, computation, that will typically be of one type of data, while different values like a pressure or don't know what will then again be in a separate file potentially. <coughs> so as I mentioned, if you open a file, uh, you have a default file view which means you start to read and to write right at, at the beginning of the file, and the elementary type is set to be an MPI byte. So in theory, you can do everything with the default file view. Um, of course, if you don't set a file view, which is perfectly legal, uh, you are basically giving up, up on a number of potential optimizations. Yeah. Now, um, without going into the details of every single argument, the one item that I wanted to highlight on this slide was uh, another aspect of MPI IO, namely the ability to register your own data representation. So whenever you set a file view, you have the possibility to, to, to tell the IO library what the format of the data 
should be that you plan to write or read from the file. So similarly to, I don't know whether you are familiar with the HDF5 uh, library, you can basically specify that if I want to write a float, it should follow the IEEE whatever standard in big endian representation or little endian representation or whatever. So MPI IO allows for registering how the data should be written onto the disk. It predefines three different formats. The native format, which basically is uh, the data is stored exactly in the same manner like you are storing it in your memory. The internal representation, uh, which basically is for heterogeneous environments using a single MPI IO library. So what that would basically give you is if you have a mixture of big endian and little endian architectures and you dump data to disk, as long as you use the same IO library, you should have interoperability between the output files. Yeah? And a completely uh, portable format using the external 32 representation, which is defined uh, to be big endian following a 32 uh, bit platform or processor. Yeah? Uh, the data length for every item has been defined. I think IEEE flo uh, floating point formats have been defined. Uh, so basically, um, that should be the most portable way on how to write data. Um, to the best of my knowledge, nobody ever used anything else than native. But this doesn't mean that the feature is useless. Yeah. Uh, more importantly, by the way, also MPI has also functions that allow you to register your own data representation functions. Basically, you need to provide a function to convert data for read operations, for write operations, and that gives you the size of a particular data type within the data representation. And ultimately, those functions, basically, you can register here uh, with this argument. Your filter, let's call it a filter, because prob that's probably what it is most closest, uh, that should be used before reading or writing data to and from the file. Um, another interesting aspect, by the way, if you change the file view, um, the file pointers are automatically moved to the beginning of your file view again. Yeah. So it basically uh, is equivalent also to a seek operation to the beginning of your file. All right, now <coughs> along those same lines, um, for general read and write operations, MPI follows its usual format of having a buffer pointer number of elements of data type and a data type argument. And what this really gives you is if you know that you need to write n integers, you can perform the data conversion before dumping the data onto disk. If you would just have a byte stream, you would basically not have the required information and you, you could not do that. So basically these arguments give you the power to utilize the data representation functions than uh, shown previously. Yeah. All right, um, this is just a very brief overview of the rich semantics of MPI. Uh, MPI IO itself has, defines over 50 interfaces. So that, that's uh, actually a fairly large chapter from that perspective. So basically the way you can separate data access operations in MPI IO are first of all collective versus non-collective, which means individual IO operations. This file only summarizes the individual I.O. operations. And in the, with, even within that block, you can separate on how, how the location where you write data is being specified, so the positioning within the file. And you have there in either individual file pointers, which means every process will continue where it stopped at the previous operation, right? So similarly to POSIX, if you do a POSIX write, one write operation, uh, so uh, uh, if write operation continues where the previous write operation has stopped, so more or less you are maintaining internally, implicitly, the position of the file pointer on a per process basis. MPI also defines explicit offset operations that's uh, along the lines of P write and P read operations that I'm not even sure are they truly POSIX or not because they are not available on every platform. But uh, think of it that way, a file pointer truly only identifies the file that you are accessing, not the location of the, uh, within the file. You need to tell every single uh, read or write operation ex uh, precisely where in the file, at what position you would like to access data. The functions in MPI in that case have the appendix at uh, 
to indicate that you need to specify where to read and to write. MPI also uh, provides a shared file pointer, and I will talk about them a bit later in details, where basically the file pointer itself is maintained jointly by a group of processes. So basically what this gives you is whatever process 0 did influences what process 1 will do as well, because, well, you might continue reading or writing data where process 0 stopped reading and writing data. Now, in addition, you can also separate the functions by synchronism, so whether you are blocking or non-blocking. And as usual, the MPI uh, terminology for non-blocking is a li little bit misreading, at least, at least if you are comparing it to non-blocking I.O. operations in POSIX. Uh, so I if you try to compare that to uh, POSIX operations, it's more along the lines of asynchronous I.O. operations in POSIX, yeah. where you start the operation and the operation is supposed to be going on in the background and you have a function to check for the completion. All right, now, <coughs> um, let me point out as a motivation for collective I.O. operations, very common usage scenario in MPI I.O. Let's assume you have a parallel application consisting of four processes, and each process operates in one part of a common, and let's assume, large matrix. So in, our, in the example over here, basically what I did was we have an, uh, a 2D matrix using a row major ordering of the data, which means the elements are stored along the row of, every, uh, of, of the matrix. And the pro each process holds basically two columns of the overall matrix. So because of the row major ordering, what this basically means is that the process 0 will need the elements 1 and 2 uh, in the file, elements 9 and 10, 17, 18, and so on. So basically what this gives you is you see that every process, in order to read the data that is, it's supposed to be operating on, will have to read m many but very short uh, data elements from the file. So Process 0 reading the first two elements, basically. Uh, so, so in this particular example, process 0 basically will have to post four read operations of two elements. Process 1 will have to post four read operations of two elements. 3 and 4, of course, the very same way. And this is problematic. For I.O., that's, that's, that's a major problem. Because first of all, um, moving the, f the disk header in a storage system is one of the most costly operations that you can perform. Um, usually the comparison that I, that I give to my students in, in the class is uh, the seek time to reposition the disk header is in the range of 7 to 10 milliseconds. That's approximately the same time it takes to send a data item over the internet from New York to Los Angeles. Yeah. So before your data can actually start, uh, b before you even receive the first byte of, from your data, an enormous amount of time is really being uh, spent. Um, now, what this gives you basically is if you would do individual I.O. operations in this particular scenario, you would have 16 I.O. requests that come in in random order to the storage. Now, if you are truly talking about two bytes, of course, the, you hope that the caching slash buffering of your storage can handle that. But if you make the data large enough, that will not be the case. So you will have a constant uh, repositioning of the disk header, disk header to perform these read and write operations, and that will lead to terrible performance. Yeah, uh, so yeah, you have a particular order from one process's perspective, but you don't have necessarily perfect synchronicity across the processes. And because of that, the order in which the I.O. requests arrive at the storage is basically completely random. Yeah. So <clears throat> how do collective I.O. operations help? Well. If you know that everybody is participating in that particular read or write operation, you don't have to actually execute the exact I.O. operations requested by the process, but you can do certain optimizations underneath the hood. So for example, what you could easily do is you could combine I.O. requests from two processes, like 0 and 1, and issue only four read operations of four bytes each, followed by send up. Uh, let's say by process 0, and process 0 then sends the elements that are supposed to be sent to process 1, the elements 3 and 4 underneath the hood to process 1. 
So you basically can combine the I.O. requests, rearrange them to match the data layout on a file, and use communication operations as well as I.O. Uh, to optimize the overall execution time. Now, don't take this particular instance as the optimal solution. In fact, you can easily come up with even better solutions, such as let's, let's assume every process reads an entire row of the data and then broadcasts or, or scatters the data to the required processes. Bottom line is, if you have a collective I.O. operation, you know that every process in the communicator that has been used to open the file is basically uh, participating in that operation, and it's completely up to the I.O. library on how to optimize that access. Uh, if you are using individual I.O. operations, you do not have that flexibility because you simply do not know who else is right now performing an I.O. operation on that file. And it, it clearly, by the way, any optimization that you introduce is a will have a trade-off. You introduce additional communication operations. And basically what you hope is that the benefit of the uh, optimized I.O. access that you have because of that outweighs the additional costs of the communication operations. That's basically the trade-off that you are having in collective I.O. operations. All right, so collective I.O., um, the algorithm that is mostly used right now uh, is based on, uh, on the two-phase I.O. algorithm introduced earlier this century. <laughs> um, basically what it does is it reorganizes data across uh, processes to match the data layout on the file. Uh, so, so fundamentally, once again, the, the problem is that your data distribution might not match the, in the data distribution of your parallel application might not match the data layout on file. And with the two-phase I.O. algorithm, you basically try to rearrange data underneath the hood such that you do have uh, do match the data layout on the file. Um, the advantage is, or so basically you are combining I.O. operations and MPI level communication. Um, so historically, MPI level communication was much faster than uh, communication over the I.O. network. That has also changed a bit over the last couple of years. You see more and more like people using also InfiniBand for the I.O. network. While in former time, it was not that uncommon that you had InfiniBand for for message passing, for example, and Ethernet, gigabit Ethernet for your I.O. network, which basically meant that your advantage of performing the reshuffling of the data on the message passing network was uh, significantly larger than if you let it do the file system. Yeah. Um, there's still an advantage to that, but I think the, the differences have leveled out a little bit over the last couple of years. Um, two other interesting aspects of collective I.O. algorithms, one is that typically only a subset of the participating processes in the collective I.O. operations actually touch the file. Those processes are referred to the aggregators. And once again, it's one of the advantages of that higher level of abstraction that you do not need to specify in advance how many processes will actually touch the file. Um, if you have an MPI application with tens of thousands of processes, you typically will not want all 10,000 of them uh, operate on a file system. File systems will not like that. Um, Second optimization that you can do underneath the hood, um, since you are basically gathering data from multiple processes on these aggregators, you will need to allo allocate temporary buffers on those aggregator processes, and you typically do, don't want to have to allocate tens of gigabytes of additional temporary memory on those aggregator processes. So typically, very large read and write operations are basically split into multiple cycles. And this allows A, to limit the, uh, the buffer sizes, the temporary buffer sizes on the aggregator processes, and B, it allows to overlap the data shuffling across the processes and the I.O. operations themselves. Yeah. All right, um, shared file pointer operations, uh, very briefly, um, is not a very commonly used feature in MPI for various reasons, uh, although I think it's a powerful mechanism. Uh, basically, a shared file pointer is a file pointer where the position of the file pointer is jointly maintained by a group of processes. So um, I'll have an example in, in, on the next slide. Um, uh, fundamentally, what a shared file pointer operation gives you, however, is you might not necessarily have deterministic behavior in your application because the order on how operations happen across the process matters. Um, <coughs> Shared file pointers are defined such that they must not interfere with individual file pointers. 
I am not aware of an application that uses both shared file pointers and individual file pointers at the same time. But if you would do that, basically they must not interfere with each other. Underneath the hood, what that basically means is you have to open the file twice. Yeah. Um, all processes must have identical file views in order for shared file pointer operations to make sense. And two scenarios that, that uh, are commonly cited where shared file pointers could make sense would be something like writing a parallel log file, where basically every process locks whatever happens right now and the order, uh, well, and you want to just create one output file across all, all processes, right? A second aspect could be if you want to use the input file um, for work distribution. So instead of having maybe something like a master worker framework, you could basically have every process simply grabbing the next piece of work from the file and the file pointer basically is moved depending on which piece of the work has been grabbed last independent of who did that. Yeah. So just very, very briefly, a simple example to process scenario. Process zero reads initially four bytes, which basically move, will move the, or four elements, four integers, whatever, which will move the shared file pointer from po position zero to position four. And if process one then, for example, leads, reads one integer value, he will simply read the next element from uh, starting from where process zero stopped. And if you have now from, from the logical perspective, uh, a file shared read, file read shared operation from two processes at the same time, in reality, I mean, what it comes down to is that the access to the shared file pointer has to be serialized. And whoever grabs the shared file pointer first will read the first elements, uh, whoever, and, and so on. So ultimately, this just highlights the non-deterministic nature of, of, of the shared file pointers. Yeah. Consistency of file operations. So I mentioned that MPI has this notion of the relaxed consistent, consistency semantics uh, such that changes to the file are initially visible only to that process itself. Um, if that's not what you want, M you can change the fundamental behavior of a file using the MPI file set atomicity function, where you can basically try to enforce a strict, uh, strict uh, serial consistency. The problem with that, of course, is that you will have a significant performance degradation because ultimately you are forcing the MPI library to perform a sync on the file system after every single and, and before every single uh, operation. Yeah. Does it penalize both write and read operations when you do that? I think you have to. If you really want to enforce a strict consistency, you have to do that. Yeah. Um, honestly, that's, however, one of the things that we did not yet implement. Um, I know roughly what our competitors do, but I haven't looked into all the details of that aspect. Yeah. Um, the file set atomicity function is a collective operation. Uh, so um, every process has to participate in that. If you just want to ensure that you are, the data that a process writes to the disk is actually touch, is actually uh, been moved or flushed to the disk, there's a function called MPI file sync where a single process can actually enforce that whatever he has written is being dumped to the disk. Yeah. So I mentioned that MPI also supports the notion of hints. So first of all, what is a hint? A hint is, well, a hint to the I.O. library on what you plan to do. Um, and the way hints are defined in MPI very generally is if the MPI I.O. library understands a hint, it has to follow it, but it is free to ignore hints. Okay? So basically, if it doesn't understand a hint, if it doesn't prefer not to implement a particular hint, it is free to do that. But if it understands it, it has to follow, um, uh, f follow that particular semantic. So for example, one of the hints defined in, defined in MPI I.O. are the access style, which basically allows you to specify the manner in which the file will be accessed, such as read once, write once, read mostly, write mostly, sequential, reverse sequential, etc. So the I.O. library, um, for example, l let's pick sequential and reverse sequential. If you are specifying that your file will be accessed sequentially for read operations, for example, it could do aggressive prefetching. If you do reverse sequential, 
It could also do uh, aggressive prefetching, but basically you know which blocks to prefetch. Uh, that's basically what it tells you. If, if you are telling the I.O. library that you will have a random access, you could turn off prefetching because it basically doesn't help. Yeah? So that's the, uh, basically the level of uh, support that hints would give you. Um, there are a number of other aspects that allow you to optimize or to give additional information on the file system, such as striping factor, striping unit of the file system. I would claim that most of the time the I.O. library should be able to retrieve that information by themselves. Basically, if you want to force the application to not use the default settings of the file system, that would be, however, a mechanism that you could use. So you say, I know that the storage here has, I don't know, 64 object storage targets in Lustra. I prefer to stripe my file only uh, using 16 of them. You could basically uh, tell the I.O. library that you, that's what you would like to do. Yeah? Or if you would like to restrict, uh, uh, restrict which I.O. nodes you would like to use, etc. Okay. All right, so this was the high-level overview about uh, MPI-IO. Um, let's talk now for a couple of minutes about our own implementation, OMPIO, and uh, maybe to set the stage there. Um, so OpenMPI, as well as, as far as I know, every other MPI library out there has used so far a parallel IO or an MPI-IO implementation out of Argon called Rome.io, um, it, which is a very stable and high-quality MPI-IO implementation. We saw, however, however, a couple of reasons on why to pursue our own implementation. Um, and let me try to motivate that part first. So first of all, we were looking for a highly modular architecture for parallel I.O. that basically takes advantage of the modular component architecture of OpenMPI. Basically, OpenMPI already offers this incredibly, incredible flexibility through its component architecture um, that we basically wanted to uh, take advantage to maximize code reuse, minimize code replication, et cetera. Now, that is probably true for every, soft, every reasonable software project out there. But I think I'll be able to motivate on why I think we are able to do a better job than uh, a pretty good job with that aspect. Um, and this has to do with the second aspect, namely ge the generalization of the selection of modules. Mm -hmm. So Rome.io internally has an abstraction layer called ADIO to support specific file systems. And basically, based on the file system, Rome.io is able to uh, load a different ADIO module or component uh, for each file. So you could argue that that's already fairly flexible. The downside of that is that any selection logic that they have is purely based on the file system that they are utilizing. And this is at least for two aspects of MPI.io, in my opinion. Um, not sufficient. One is collective I.O. algorithms, where even if you have a particular file system, the algorithm that you might actually want to use might not just depend on the file system itself, but it might depend on things like your access pattern, your file view, etc. So I will give uh, some examples on, on that. Uh, the second uh, area could be shared file pointer operations, where I will argue that uh, shared file pointer operations are usually considered to be very slow. That might not necessarily be always the case, because for certain scenarios, let's assume you have a communicator where all processes are on a single node, you could actually have a fairly efficient shared file pointer implementation based on a shared memory region. Okay? Uh, so purely selecting, making their the decision on what shared file pointer implementation to use, just purely based on the file system, is simply not sufficient. And that's, that's the generalization that we really were focusing on that we try to bring in. Um, a tighter integration with the OpenMPI library uh, also has a couple of interesting advantages um, compared to the standalone I.O. library uh, that we had so far. One, we could basically do a tight integration with a derived data type engine of OpenMPI and take advantage of all of uh, its optimizations, all of its data conversion functions for the data representation, etc. Um, <coughs> in addition, uh, we basically, we didn't do that yet, but we plan to have basically an, an integration with the progress engine of OpenMPI for the non-blocking I.O. operations. We had a couple of interesting discussions there with George on how to do that. Uh, we just were lacking simply the manpower to actually uh, 
do that, but that's basically all of these things cannot be done easily if you are treating the MPI library as a black box. So basically you have to take advantage of some of the internals of, of the MPI library. Now last but not least, uh, a very important goal I think uh, is the adaptability, the flexibility that you gain by the overall om open MPI architecture. And just to motivate that, I mean, if you look at the diversity of I.O. hardware and software solutions available out there, I'm very close to claiming that there are no two systems that are uh, identical um, out there. So every uh, cluster, every uh, HPC system has different storage configurations, different hardware, the bandwidth between the storage servers and the compute cluster, etc. Uh, all the different type of network connectivities. So you have such an incredible variety in the available solutions that basically any one, one size fits all solution will fail ultimately. The, uh, uh, and the key word there for me is the out of box performance that you can provide. That's really what, what makes it challenging. OpenMPI basically with its MCA architecture and its uh, MCA parameters offers an interface that allows to easily adapt whatever you are doing to the current environment without having to uh, modify code or whatever. So that's that's really uh, an important aspect. And last but not least, I mean, I'm, I did not uh, attend the talks on Monday, but I'm pretty sure that uh, both Jeff and Brian brought that up. The, the ability to just simply drop in a component for a particular operation without necessarily having to release the source code from a commercial perspective, uh, that I think could be a big advantage for uh, OmPyO as well in terms of that um, vendors might be able to just write a parallel I.O. component focusing on a particular aspect or for a particular hardware and they just would be able to take advantage of the overall uh, architecture without having to uh, release everything. Yeah. Uh, just as a reminder, um, I'm pretty sure that that graph was there on Monday as well. So the open MPI architecture basically uh, the MPI layer is implemented on top of the modular component architecture, which basically manages frameworks. Each framework in itself is basically uh, responsible for one functional abstraction, whether it's point-to-point -point communication, collective communication, or I.O. operations from that perspective. Until recently, or actually until today, all released versions of OpenMPI had just one I.O. component available, namely Romeo. In the 1.7 series, we'll have now OmPyO second component also available. And OmPyO in itself is a component of the I.O. MCA framework, but uh, it's not everything is implemented in OmPyO. In fact, OmPyO in itself, upon selection, will trigger the selection logic of a number of additional frameworks that we introduced. One is basically uh, for individual read and write operations, the FBTL framework, the file byte transfer layer framework. Um, we have an abstraction for uh, collective I.O. operations, the FCOL framework, for file system level operations, the FS framework, and for shared file pointer operations, the shared FB framework. Now, is this sufficient? Um, we had actually originally an additional uh, framework design, the FCache framework for caching information about the file system. We removed that right now um, because we simply did not see that in the foreseeable future we'll have manpower to do anything in that domain. And the one other framework that we were seriously thinking about, but for very similar reasons we didn't do that yet, is a, a data caching framework. Yeah, where basically you could plug in different data caching strategies to be utilized by the I.O. library uh, depending on on your usage scenario, on your file system, etc. So I'll, I'll talk about them in a bit in more details. OmPyO is the main I.O. component basically that we provide is really, uh, from the logical perspective, the main, uh, yeah, the, the, the driving I.O. Uh, component. It's basically the component that understands MPI semantics and breaks it down into lower level read and write operations. Um, so from that perspective, it basically provides our implementation of the MPI file handle. It deals with all the file view related operations and once we have the time, it will also be the place where the request structure is actually being uh, implemented. 
um, I mentioned that basically, if you decide to use OmPaio versus Romeo once, um, so the selection is basically triggered every time a file is being opened on MPI file open. On MPI file open, basically, uh, the I.O. framework will uh, ask both Romeo and OmPaio whether they want to run. If OmPaio is selected, which right now only happens if you explicitly tell the system you want to use OmPaio, um, it will then trigger the selection logic of the FCOL, FS, FBTL, and shared FP frameworks. So otherwise, the FCOL, FS, FBTL, and shared FP framework will not be touched at all. So. And that's on a, a per file basis? That's right? on a per file basis, yes. I, I would have to look it up. I th I'm pretty sure that uh, the FCOL, FS, FBTL, and shared FP frameworks they are opened in MPI init, similarly to all other frameworks, but basically uh, nothing happens with them otherwise. Yeah. All right, the file byte transfer layer. So it's basically the abstraction for individual read and write operations. Um, and what, they what it basically offers is um, what we call the pwrite-v interfaces. So there's no such POSIX I.O. function, but basically we try to combine what pwrite and what writeV offers, namely having the ability to explicitly say where data is being, uh, where data needs to be written or read, as well as the ability to provide an entire list of arguments at one point. Ultimately, uh, the more information you can provide in a single read or write operation, typically the better the performance. And that's why we chose that abstraction. Uh, we have interfaces for both blocking and non-blocking operations. The non-blockings, as I mentioned, are currently not implemented. For the non-blocking operations, also we'll foresee a progress function that will be registered with the progress engine. Yeah. The arguments of these functions, I mean, except for the progress function, basically take a buffer pointer length and positioning file uh, description. Um, originally, our design um, basically anticipated the ability to have more than one FBTL instance per file and per process open. So what we thought about is to have the ability to, to do direct I.O. to individual storage servers. Basically, that if you, if you know the layout of your data on, on, on a storage system, you have the ability to separate out requests for one particular I.O. server and use an FBTL to basically just communicate with one I.O. server only. Realistically, this has not yet happened. It's once again just a question of manpowers. Meanwhile, I'm also not 100% sure whether it would truly give you too many advantages. You, you, you can do similar things on the collective level more easily than on the individual level, but it's something to, to keep in the back of our heads that it was originally part of the design. FCOL framework, uh, abstractions for collective I.O. operations, basically for all versions of collective read and write operations. Um, the, in, the most interesting aspect, in my opinion, on the collective I.O. framework is that it's the only framework where the selection logic is not triggered upon opening the file, but upon setting the file view. So simply, if you change your file view, the algorithm that you use for collective I.O. operation uh, might change on, on what would, could be uh, most beneficial. Implicitly, of course, because you have uh, the default file view set on MPI file open, we do uh, trigger also the, collection, uh, the selection logic of collective I.O. operations on file open as well, but that's just uh, incidental uh, from that perspective. Um, right now, we provide implementations for the blocking versions of the collective I.O. operations. MPI does not define, at this point, non-blocking versions of the collective I.O. operations, but they define what they refer to as split collectives. So the ability to have a read-all begin and a read-all end operation, but you cannot have more than one ongoing split collective I.O. operations on a file at any given point in time. Um, we... we <laughs> I'm not sure how to formulate it. It would be fairly easy for us to provide the implementation for those functions, but we did not see right now the necessity, necessity to do that. Um, we had a project, I will talk about that uh, towards the end, on non-blocking collective I.O. operations. So we have a full implementation of non-blocking collective I.O. operations. So one could argue that uh, 
split collectives should be easy to map. It turns out it's not that trivial because you don't have a request handle in these functions. Yeah. Because of that, however, I, uh, I think it is generally understood that uh, the benefits of these split collectives are fairly, fairly limited. Yeah. Now, and just to point out, uh, because I truly think that this is one of the things that sets us apart from our competitors, the selection logic of the FCOL framework. Basically, our current internal algorithm on which collective I.O. module to use is depending on the stripe size of your file system. So what's the size of a data chunk on one I.O. node before you move to the next I.O. node? Uh, the average chunk size in your file view. The minimum data sa uh, size to saturate your read and write brand with. That's a data item that is not that trivial to determine, but a system administrator could easily do that once and then set that for the for the I.O. Uh, or for that given cluster, as well as the size of a gap in a file view. And basically, based on a number of tests that we executed, we came up uh, with a table uh, where you take all of these characteristics into account. Um, these ones are basically fixed for the file system. These ones are application specific. Okay? Uh, these two are application specific. And based on that, we choose different algorithms to be used underneath the hood for different operations. And this is clearly something that cannot be done if your selection logic is purely based on just a file system that you're utilizing. Okay. The FS framework um, basically handles all file system related operations. Um, we were arguing for a long time whether the FS operations should be part of the FBTL framework or not. Uh, the main reason that we did not do that is because the MPI semantics for open, close, delete, sync, etc., are collective. And we didn't want to have collective operations in the FBTL framework. Yeah. Um, what this gives you, by the way, I mean, there's at least one file system, the PVFS2 file system, where you could do something like a single process executes an actual file open, and the file handle is then broadcasted to all other processes. Basically, the file handle is not a per process, but it's a portable instance. Yeah, I'm not aware of anybody else doing that, but uh, a collective open operation would allow for those type of optimizations. Yeah. I notice you don't have seek up there. Is that because you don't need it because your reads are always relative to, you just have to specify a location? Yes. But that's a very good question. We have somewhere seek. The question is just where. Um, so, but ultimately, you know what, I, I think you are correct. I think we do not have seek in here because the seek operation on the MPI level, we are actually implementing it in the OMPIO module. It never touches an FPTL. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, um, one, I, one other item that I basically wanted to mention, the current Lustre and PVFS2 FS components that we have allowed you to modify stripe size, stripe depths, and I.O. servers used uh, for that file. Um, I'm personally not full, fully 100% happy on the, on the logic that we are utilizing right now to perform that, but, and that might be uh, due, to, due for, to a revamp. But from the pure logical perspective, I think it is the right, w right place to do it. Let me put it this way. Yeah. So the current status. Um, so um, what components do we have available? Um, FPTL, we have a generic POSIX component that you can use basically on top of every file system that we tested so far. We have in a PVFS2 FBTL that takes advantage of some internal PVFS2 functions. PVFS2 basically has some read and write interfaces that allow you to describe uh, strided access patterns in a more compact manner than just with a list. Yeah, and we basically support them. We did play around with kernel I.O. functions uh, on the FBTL layer. So basically, I.O. underscore read, I.O. underscore write. Um, they show performance advantages in some scenarios, not in others. It's not in the trunk. Uh, we are not fully convinced that at this point it's worth uh, it's, it's worthwhile looking into them. But basically, if somebody is interested, we can uh, dig them out. We have them somewhere. 
On the collective I.O. layer, we have basically four different modules. Individual is basically a component that uh, basically just executes an individual read and write directly, no communication at all. Um, dynamic segmentation, static segmentation, and two-phase I.O. are basically all derivatives of the two-phase I.O. component, um, shifting uh, the optimizations from communication to I.O. in various manners. I'll talk about them a bit later. Uh, there's a component uh, for that uh, I.O. layer that basically separates out data to individual uh, storage servers. So basically, if you have a parallel file system, we, each aggregator will only communicate with one I.O. server at any given point in time. That's the YLIP component. Um, it, is, it is in trunk. It is in 1.7, but it's not being used. Uh, we didn't see any performance advantage at any file system. That, that's why we uh, didn't a truly activate it, but, but from the pure coding perspective, it's there. On a file system level, we have support for regular Unix file systems, PVFS2 and Lustra. Especially for Lust uh, PVFS2 and Lustra, both basically the main difference really is just that you have the ability to modify number of I.O. servers, uh, stripe size, stripe depth, etc., in the uh, for that particular file. Yeah. The shared file pointer framework right now is just has no op component in it, but we have developed all the required uh, components in a standalone I.O. library originally roughly two years back, and one of our students is currently working on uh, converting that to proper OMPIO components. He is mostly done. Um, basically, what we'll have, and, and I mentioned that, um, actually, where do I mention that? I don't know. <laughs> uh, we have come up with various algorithms on, on how to maintain the shared file pointer. Um, Romeo implements a shared file pointer management uh, by introducing a separate file that contains the position of the shared file pointer. And you need file locking. Basically, you need to lock that additional file that you have that contains the shared file pointer in order to modify it. So what it requires is basically that your file system needs to support file locking, which not everybody does. Yeah, so it, basically in Romeo, if your file system does not support file locking, uh, it will abort a shared file pointer operation, saying it is not supported. We basically um, experimented with uh, maintaining the shared file pointer in, in, an, in an additional process. Originally, we spawned an additional process, but the long-term goal was to discuss whether that could be done within MPI run. That's something to, to discuss, maybe. Um, we have basically a version where if all processes are on one single node, the shared file pointer can be managed in a shared memory segment. And we have one version which puts some restrictions on the usage scenarios. Uh, but um, if the user basically guarantees us that the file is only accessed in a write-only mode, and he is OK with slight inconsistencies in the order of the data, um, and I, I can explain in a bit what I mean, then basically we write data out into separate files per process and we just maintain sufficient metadata to be able to merge them afterwards. Okay? So the main restriction is that we are relying on a synchronized clock across the nodes. And basically, we, are, we have the restriction that we are down to the accuracy of the synchronization between the clocks. Yeah. I would claim that in most scenarios, it, is, it could be a reasonable solution, but it might not be exactly the order on how things happen. Yeah? So just a couple of performance numbers um, and just highlighting so, some of our flexibility. Um, so Tile IO is a, a very popular MPI IO benchmark um, that basically uh, splits a big matrix file in, in, in a tiled manner, similarly to what I've described over there. And what I wanted to show is that depending on the size of the tile, um, OMPIO is basically selecting different uh, IO algorithms to be used. Um, and different number of aggregators. And I'm not showing that here for various reasons. But ultimately, those two things combined out of the box without the user having to do anything, you are basically able to improve the performance that you actually observe in all scenarios compared to, to uh, Romeo. Yeah? So I, I think that's, 
And, and at this point, really, I think the goal is not necessarily to, to look truly at the performance numbers, because uh, you can tune Romeo, of course, as well to increase its performance on these particular scenarios. The, 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 the thing really is that you have the flexibility for these things to happen underneath the hood without the user having to do anything. Yeah? Different algorithms, different number of aggregators to be used. Now, you can take that one step further if you want to truly perform a particular tuning step of OMPIO for a particular application or particular file system. There's this tool that was developed originally by Cisco and the University of Houston called the Open Tool for Parameter Optimization, or TOPO. Um, basically, what it does is um, you specify in an input file the MCA parameters that you would like to explore, along with the ranges. Um, you specify the benchmark that's supposed to be run. Uh, we extended Otopo basically to support a number of the parallel I.O. benchmarks, such as style I.O., latency I.O., some of the NAS parallel benchmarks, etc. And basically, you can now try to tune the I.O. library uh, for that particular scenario. The advantage, once again, being is you don't have to recompile your code. Yeah? And Otopo has various search algorithms that it can use internally to, to tune the open MPI parameters. Um, in this particular test, we tuned what collective module to be used, how many aggregator processes to use, what is the internal cycle buffer size to be used in these operations. Um, it was not a truly large test, but it highlights basically uh, the flexibility of the overall framework. So it evaluated all in all 64 different parameter combinations, and two of them basically led to significantly better performance than, than the other ones. And once again, it, it just shows the flexibility of the framework. Um, Meanwhile, we went a couple of uh, steps further with some of these tuning scenarios. Another student of mine, not focusing on I.O., but basically just uh, taking the tuning of OpenMPI MCA parameters simply to the next step. And we were honestly shocked on the performance that you can gain by running some of these tuning steps over InfiniBand, shared memory parameters, collective parameters. So without changing anything else in your application, basically, we so partially performance improvements to from 20 to 40 percent. Yeah. So. Oh yeah. So I think that slide should have come a little earlier. Yes. So shared file point of framework. Oh, actually, I remember why I moved the result slide first because the result slide are related to the collective I/O operations. But anyway, shared file point of framework. I I mentioned already the various implementations that we have for the. Uh, for the maintenance of the shared file pointer operation. Um, just two more brief remarks. Um, MPI defines collective shared file pointer operations. However, the terms are slightly different than what you might expect. Um, basically, the shared file pointer operations are, the collective shared file pointer operations are defined in an ordered manner, which means data from process zero will come first before data from process one before data from process two, and so on. So they are, that's why they are not called MPI file read all shared, but they are called MPI file read all ordered. But they are based on the shared file pointer position. And the neat thing about them, however, is that um, it turns out you can truly uh, map shared, ordered, collective ordered operations using a shared file pointer to regular collective operations because you really just have to determine the initial position of the shared file pointer once. And you can then base map the collective shared file pointer operation to a collective explicit offset I.O. operation. Yeah? And basically, your performance there will be much, much higher than for uh, regular shared file pointer operations. Okay? Because you are really just having once the overhead of retrieving the current position of the shared file pointer instead of once for every process. And our decision logic um, that we're working on basically will take into account the location of processes, available, availability of some file system level features, and hints by the user. Like what, what uh, not restrictions, but the contrary of restrictions are relaxation, not relaxations. Uh, well, what. Uh, what are his requirements in terms of what is he willing to uh, take uh, into account for shared file pointer operations? Yeah. All right. So, current status, part two.
So the code was commit. Uh, the code was actually a long time in development. Since um, I, th I think I should have mentioned that early on, I just forgot about it. So all of these discussions about Umpio started out roughly 2006, jointly between University of Houston, Oak Ridge at that time, and University of Tennessee. Um, the code was mostly developed at the University of Houston. Right now, we have uh, a group in Stuttgart basically looking into GPFS support for Umpio, so that's uh, positive. Um, but it was in a long time developed basically as a standalone HG tree. Uh, we brought it into uh, OpenMPI in August 2011, and it will now be part of the 1.7 release series. <coughs> Excuse me. So what is missing, as I mentioned, split collective operations, um, shared file pointer operations, but that's really on the verge of now being brought in very soon. Non-blocking individual I.O. and atomic access mode. Atomic access is, I would claim, fairly easy. Uh, so if there's demand, it's easily doable. It's just that it was not a high priority for us so far. And non-blocking I.O. operations, that's a little more work, but we understand on how it should be done. It's just a question of, of manpower. All right, so uh, which brings us to part three. Um, and I might actually go over some of those slides a little quicker than, uh, than over the first couple of slides. Uh, depending on the interest, we can, however, dive into some of the, these discussions. If you would ask me what are our selling points compared to our competition, uh, it's, basic, it's basically summarized on this slide. So basically, our flexibility uh, in terms of what modules are being used is really the main difference, in my opinion, to Romeo. Um, I mentioned some of the, I mentioned the logic behind our collective I.O. Uh, modules, uh, as well as on the shared file pointer level. Um, but we also worked a lot on optimizing collective I.O. operations themselves. Three specific aspects that could be of interest there, basically. One is we developed an entire couple of in, uh, we, we develop new algorithms for collective I.O. operations that, uh, that uh, look more into the communication aspects of collective I.O. versus the I.O. operation itself. The reason being, as I mentioned, is that I think, uh, that, that I think the, the gap between in the performance of the message passing network versus I.O. network has shifted a bit over the years. And basically, it's not that clear cut anymore what level of communication you can do in order to outgain or out outperform uh, direct individual I.O. operations. And we've come up basically with two algorithms where you are gradually shifting the communication costs basically by taking some, uh, some hits in the potential I.O. performance into account. We have developed algorithms to automatically determine the number of aggregators for collective I.O. operations. Uh, and we have developed uh, a new RMAPS component to optimize the, uh, the process placement based on the I.O. access pattern. Um, I'm assuming that that last part is um, of, of interest for you. Um, outside of that, what is not in the trunk, or mostly not in the trunk, is we've, uh, we had full implementations of non-blocking collective I.O. operations uh, that were nearly voted into MPI3. They passed the first vote. They were kicked out on the second vote for, for various reasons. Um, and we have developed a, a, another library um, that deals with multi-threaded I.O. operations. I will just very, very briefly uh, touch on that aspect on, on the last couple of slides. Let me talk just very briefly now first about the uh, communication optimizations that we performed for collective I.O. operations. So um, first of all, le let's take a simple scenario. So this is your file layout. The numbers in the files are basically the blocks in the file, uh, of course, in a sequential manner. Uh, the color coding basically indicates, based on the data distribution of that application, which block is supposed to be on which process. So basically, the blue blocks are on blue process 0, green box, uh, blocks on process 1, etc. Now, if you assume you have a collective write operation, basically, um, with two aggregators, what this basically means is that process 0 will have to gather the blocks as listed over here in that order. Process 2, assuming process 2 is the second aggregator process, we'll have to gather those blocks. 
What this basically means is every process communicates with every aggregator process in the most generic sense. And these all-to-all -all style operations clearly do not scale very well to a large number of processes. What we basically did was we came up with algorithms where you are restricting the processes communicating with a particular aggregator. The goal being is you tr still want to reorganize data to match the data layout. But you might not need perfect sequential ordering of the data to achieve good performance. You basi basically, the goal is to create chunks from on an aggregator that are large enough from the file system perspective to be efficient. Yeah? So for example, if you group the processes such that process 0 and 1 are in one group, you create chunks of data that are larger than what process 0 or process 1 could do on its own. But you are restricting, instead of having an all-to-all -all style communication between the processes, you're actually restricting the communication pattern to be only occur within that subgroup of processes. Okay? Um, in a most generic sense, and that's what we are working right now in, is you are truly able to come up with an algorithm where you split processes into groups and each group has an arbitrary number of aggregators. Uh, right now, our implementation only has one aggregator per, per group, but we already see significant performance improvements from the communication costs perspective. The static segmentation algorithm, uh, so th this is the dynamic segmentation algorithm. Basically, create subgroups, perform collective I.O. within each of those subgroups individually. The stat I'm sorry, I could mm -hmm. interrupt, but uh, do you do that basically by creating new communicators for that? No, we, we avoided that right now. We just truly have groups of processes simply because of the costs of creating a communicator. Yeah. Um, yes. I'll, I'll show, by the way, on, on another slide later on that how you create those groups can also have a big impact on, on your performance. Uh, because you can basically, linear grouping is not necessarily always the, the best way how to approach it. Um, yeah, so that's what we do in the dynamic segmentation algorithm. Basically, think of it creating subgroups, and within each of them, you try to perform something like two phase IO again. The static segmentation algorithm, I'm not showing it over here also create subgroups, but there we are truly just focusing on optimizing the communication and we completely ignore what the file system does. And we, we have a rationale for that, and the rationale for that is, uh, is that you see more and more systems popping up where the actual disk latency, you are not seeing that anymore at all, or it's very, very low. So either because you have an enormous amount of caching capacity, there's an installation, for example, at Indiana called the Data Capacitor, where they have a separate cluster, I think, 32 or 64 nodes, and their only purpose is to, to cache data before it goes to the storage system itself. Now, in all reality, if you write 100 gigs of data on that storage system, it will never actually touch the disks from the application's perspective. So the latency that you are actually seeing are close to irrelevant. The only thing that matters is that you are able to avoid every process actually touching the disk at the same time. So the static segmentation algorithm, what it basically does, it, it restricts the processes that actually touch the file, and you are focusing more on how can, I how can I optimize the data stream to the aggregator and then from the aggregator to the storage. The second motivation for that could be SSD storage systems, which have a much lower latency. We have one in, in our uh, group, a fairly high performing one. Somewhat to our surprise, we did not observe the effect that we wanted to observe there. Um, and that's uh, an interesting question on why not. Yeah, but it probably, it's probably outside of the scope of this talk. Now, automated setting number of, uh, automatically setting the number of aggregator processes. So the first thing that I would like to highlight here is the N is that this is a parameter that has an enormous influence on the performance of your I.O. operations. So what you have here is a tile I.O. benchmark run on a Lustro file system uh, and varying number of aggregators going from one aggregator to 144 aggregators, which means every process would be its own aggregator. And you see that the performance that you observe is truly uh, dramatically changing depending on how many aggregators you are using. Now, this slide might be misleading in terms of that the more aggregators you have, the better your performance. 
That's not always the case. Uh, this is the case in this particular scenario. Ultimately, basically, you have two contradicting goals when you try to determine how many processes should be aggregators. The larger the chunks that you would like to create, the fewer aggregators you would need. On the other hand, a parallel file system typically leaves from uh, uh, typi a parallel file system typically benefits from having more aggregators because it requires multiple data streams to be able to saturate it bandwidth. A single data stream, at least on a high-end system, is not able to saturate a storage, uh, the bandwidth of a large-scale storage system. Yeah, you are ultimately there simply limited by how much data can you shuffle out from that one node uh, to the storage. Yeah. Now, what what are the current uh, assumptions on how uh, how to determine the number of aggregators? Well, most people actually simply have a fixed rule for how to use it, like use one aggregator or use one aggregator per node. That's what Romeo does at this point. That they basically, for every node that you have, they, set, they, they decide to use one process as an aggregator. Um, you could also adjust the number of aggregators to the number of I.O. servers that you have or tune it for a particular platform or application. But all of that, in reality, is just suboptimal. Yeah. So basically, what we, wh what we came up with was a heuristic that uh, looks into th three different aspects. One is we want to determine the minimum data size for, a, for an individual process to saturate the bandwidth, read or write bandwidth, from that process's perspective. So yeah, let me show you in a second. So typically, if you perform a sequ sequential write operation and you increase the message length, you, you typically uh, have a graph something along those lines, that you have an increase in the bandwidth that you observe from that particular process's perspective. And once you saturate, something, and the question is, what is the something? Is it a file system? Is it your network connection? Is it your memory subsystem? You will see a flattening out of the bandwidth that you can obtain. So increasing the message size for a single write operation from that process's perspective beyond that point where the saturation occurs is pointless. You will not increase further the performance. So, and that's what we define the smallest message length where you say, I'm se observing the maximum bandwidth possible for that process is what we define to be the saturation point. Now, <coughs> we then have determined initially the number of aggregators taking the file view and or the process topology into account. What do I mean by that? Uh, basically, if your application uses something like a 2D data distribution strategy or 3D data distribution strategy, there's a large probability that your data is actually split in the very same manner like on how they logically organize the processes. And what we do is basically either based on the file view or based on the assumption that your Cartesian process topology follows that file view layout, we basically uh, right now um, assign one aggregator to each row of processes, either in the logical file view or in the Cartesian process topology. If you don't have a file view and no Cartesian topology, our initial assumption is every process is an aggregator. So that's the second step. Now in the third step, however, is, and that's really one of the current shortcomings, in my opinion, of the file view, the fact that you register a file view does not mean that you know how much data is actually being written or read in a single function call. right? And that's where really our refinement step, step three comes in, is when you actually have the MPI file write all operation, that's when you know how much data every process actually reads or writes, right? And we basically then try to calculate how much data would an aggregator process in our previous, based on our, in, on, based on our initial setting, actually write onto disk. And how does that compare to the saturation point? If it's less data than what our saturation point indicates, well, less, then basically we try to merge groups, make the group larger, such that a process is coming as close as possible to that saturation point. If it's more data, then we split groups. Okay? So ultimately, in my opinion, that is really neat, because what this really gives you is you don't have a fixed setting for in uh, for number of aggregators for 
throughout your application. But if you have an MPI file write all where you write little data, you will have fewer aggregators, which makes sense. If you have an MPI file write all where you write lots of data, you will have more aggregators. So uh, you are dynamically adjusting that throughout your run. And uh, just to show a couple of performance numbers, I mean, we ex in our initial evaluation, we executed 134 different test cases um, with four different benchmarks. And we were able to obtain, in 88 out of, of those 134 test cases, uh, we were within 10% of the optimal performance. And, within w and for 110 out of the 134 test cases, within 25% within of the best possible performance. Now, 110 out of uh, 134 is, I think, fairly neat, within 25%. The, the two or three times that I gave this talk, people were not convinced about that value. But I think what you need to understand is the I.O. performance, the differences between good and bad, is enormously large. I mean, literally, if you do things the wrong way in, in parallel I.O. or in I.O. generally, you will observe 20 megabytes versus 2,000 megabytes. So being close to the top group is already a significant achievement, in my personal opinion. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's. Uh, just a couple of words on our automatically adjusting the number of aggregators. Um, I.O. access based process placement, uh, very briefly. So basically, as I mentioned, what we want to do is we want to optimize how processes are assigned to nodes based on their I.O. access pattern. And the motivation for that is uh, actually, well, so people have done that a lot, trying to optimize the process placement based on their communication uh, pattern. The problem with that is that, that an application does not have one single communication pattern. So you very often have something like a neighborhood communication pattern ongoing at the same time with like reduction operations, maybe even with an all-to-all -all operations. And it's very, very difficult to come up with a, uh, with a reasonable placement strategy that would optimize all three of them, especially because for collective operations, you do not know what's the actual algorithm used underneath the hood. Yeah? It turns out for I.O. it's much simpler. Because I have not seen yet an application where a process has two fundamentally completely different file views for different files. Your data distribution mandates on how you access the file. So taking just the I.O. access pattern into account is, I think, easier and a, a simpler goal for the actual uh, process placement strategy. Now, you, you, of course, still have the challenge that you do not know what are the actual uh, algorithms used underneath the hood to, to optimize, uh, to implement, like, let's say, collective I.O. operations. But I think there are a couple of reasonable assumptions that you can make. Now, generally, and that's true for all process placement optimizations that I'm aware of, you need three things. You need basically the application matrix, where you know what's actually going on in the application. You need an architecture matrix, where you basically have one way or another a description of the costs for the communication between the process pairs. And you have a mapping algorithm. right? And I will right now focus on the application matrix, because that's really where we do things differently than what is out there in the literature. <coughs> so basically, our goal is to predict the communication occurring in, the, in collective I.O. algorithm based on the access pattern of the application. To be more specific, we are basically trying to optimize the communication occurring between processes and aggregator processes. And the assumption fundamentally is that processes that access neighboring parts of the file will have to communicate with the same aggregator process. Yeah. Now, in the most generic can, case, it's still a horrendously complex problem to solve, because you do not know uh, the algorithm being used, how many aggregators you have, etc. Um, there are still, however, a couple of reasonable assumptions that you can make. And there are, and more importantly, there are very common special cases that you can take advantage of, such as m very, very large number of MPI applications use a regular 2D or 3D data distribution strategy. Uh, we know what two-phase I.O. and we know what our dynamic segmentation algorithm do. Uh, and it's easy to construct an application matrix based on those assumptions. Now, but let me, uh, we, we support the most generic case, however, where you would be completely irregular as well with extended OMPIO such that you are able to dump the file view 
respectively the order on how processes access a file into a separate file. And if you run the same applications two or more times, basically you could dump the, the file view on the first execution and reuse that description in subsequent runs. That's an optimization commonly used by compilers. It's not as common in MPI, but basically it's a re-execution strategy on how to optimize that. And just to be, give a very brief description in the most generic case, basically what we are truly interested in is really not necessarily how much data a process is accesses in the file, but the order, such that basically process one accesses data uh, uh, followed by process two, followed by process one again, etc. So you are just recording the neighborhood relationships between the processes and how they access the file. And then you count, uh, you construct the application matrix by basically counting how many boundaries you have between each pair of processes in the file. And between process one and two, if you look at this example, you actually have seven boundaries. So we set the weight of the application matrix simply to be seven. If processes don't have any boundaries in the file access, it, it basically will be zero. Now, for the special cases, 2D or 3D process topology, basically we know that the vast majority of the neighborhood relationships are within a row of the matrix, and we can basically set the value to an arbitrary non-zero value, something like 100, but you could take K or some, something else as well. Yeah, but basically that matrix, if you know that you have a, a 2D matrix or four, a 3D matrix, whatever, you just have to specify the number of processes and you can dump out such an application matrix very easily. Um, how do you determine the, the architecture matrix? That's also non-trivial, but it has already been solved. I mean, in the end, you basically will have to run something like point-to-point -point benchmarks between pairs of processes and determine either latency or bandwidth or whatever you want and construct the corresponding matrix. Now, the mapping algorithm itself, um, Intel MPI, as far as I know, uses an algorithm based on the MPI PP paper to optimize the process placement, which is basi basically a randomized search heuristic where processes are randomly changing their positions and you try to calculate the gain that is occurring by changing the position of those two processes. If you run the algorithm lo long enough, you basically get close to optimal settings. Um, our personal experience, however, was in order to get really close to optimal settings, the algorithm needs to run, run for a long time. I mean, literally 10 minutes. And I doubt that people would be willing to sit in MPI run for 10 minutes just to wait for that mapping to happen. Um, we have come up with something much, much simpler, uh, what we call our set match algorithm, where basically you have, a, it's a very, very simple clustering algorithm, but it does the job in the vast majority of the cases. Not in the most generic setting. We have an implementation of, actually, our RMAPS component, components uh, that we've developed um, has MPIPP implemented, as well as the, our set match algorithm. You can choose um, wh whichever you want to use. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, just to show uh, a couple of numbers. Uh, so if you are willing to run the MPIPP algorithm, of course, uh, it gives very good performance numbers. But th the downside really is that it takes a long time for him to figure out the optimal settings. Our set match algorithm gets basically very close uh, to that setting. And if you compare it just to Binode and Byslot, we are, we are able to do better than that. We did not try the NUMA node that we discussed at supercomputing yet. Yeah. Um, but anyway, it, it just shows that basically uh, there are, there's room for optimization in that domain if, if you follow that, uh, that particular setting. Yeah. How long did it take your set match to run? Set match is very quick. It's, uh, I don't have the precise number, but it's a fraction of a second. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm, I think I'll skip most of the non-blocking collective I.O. Uh, I just want to point out that we did that, and we know how to do it. It's just not in the OpenMPI source code. Um, actually, parts of it are there, but parts of it are not, and I can mention why. So fundamentally, MPI so far does not define non-blocking collective I.O. operations. Um, the reason originally in MPI 2 was that implementers 
felt that it is too complex to implement. That was, I think, my understanding is that was also the reason why originally they did not define non-blocking collective operations. Now, with uh, LibNBC, um, people proved that it's possible to do it in a, with reasonable efforts. Our implementation basically is also based on LibNBC, although we did have to make a couple of uh, significant changes to LibNBC to make it work. Um, we demonstrated also the benefits. It passed the first vote, it failed the second vote. I think uh, there are people from MPI that, uh, MPI from that can uh, explain more why that failed uh, than me. But bottom line basically is um, a collective I.O. operation, similarly to any other collective operations, you can break it down into a sequence of steps that need to be executed. You register a schedule that needs to be executed. Um, the most important part, however, is the changes that we need to do. Um, so, so the biggest difference between collective I.O. and collective operations is in a collective operation, you typically know the arguments of other processes because MPI collective operations are fairly restrictive. In collective I.O., every process is allowed to provide different amounts of data, and nobody knows what everybody else does. So you ha basically, because of that, uh, if you think about a collective I.O. operation, uh, I mentioned that it is typically broken down into multiple cycles internally. You do not know at that beginning how many cycles you will have. Okay? Um, so because of that, you cannot construct your schedule for LibNBC. And because of that, uh, you would have to block and potentially deadlock if you do that uh, in a trivial implementation. So ultimately, what we had to do is basically we had to develop a method on how the schedule is actually constructed as part of a schedule. Yeah? Um, and that's really the main difficulty that came in. But, but uh, Vishwanath Venkatsan, my student, did a fantastic job with the help of Thorsten. Uh, so basically, we have initially we create a schedule for an all-gather operation to determine how, many, how much data every process tries to write. And then we are able to construct a new schedule on the fly in the background uh, to, to register those operations. And uh, that's all I want to say at this point to that. Uh, we had very good application performance results. But uh, yeah, the, the one thing, yeah. So the algorithms themselves, or big parts of, of the algorithms, are in the op OpenMPI trunk. The one thing that we didn't want to bring in is we also had to modify LibNBC to support AIO read and AIO write operations as primitives internally. Uh, we didn't want to make that change into, in the trunk of LibNBC simply because we anticipate that sooner or later we will have non-blocking I-write and I-read operations. In that case, that change is basically unnecessary, and we would make LibNBC unnecessarily complex. All right, last but not least, uh, another another project that is right now not in the trunk, uh, and just also two minutes on that because of that. So we also looked a lot into optimizing uh, I.O. for multi-threaded applications. So OpenMP or POSIX threads or whatever other um, threaded uh, API you want to use does not have support for multi-threaded uh, parallel I.O. operations at this point in time. Um, what we basically did is we wanted to come up with an interface that A, would allow you to take advantage of the fact that you have multiple threads, but B, avoid that you have to lock the file handle within each thread to perform the I.O. operations. So that was our reasoning behind that. And basically, we, what we came up was with a set of uh, uh, I.O. functions that you can call, let's say, from a parallel region in OpenMP. Um, because of that, you have underneath it with multiple threads that you can use for I.O. operations. Um, and we have to define simply rules on the day, where the data from which thread will be located in a file to avoid basically race conditions. And that's really the main, uh, the, the main, uh, the main achievement of that multi-threaded I.O. library that we did. So you don't have to lock the file handle anymore. You have rules clearly defined on where the data of which thread goes in, in the file. And underneath the hood, it turns out that if you have multiple threads available, there are a number of things that you can do to optimize the I.O. performance, uh, whether it's generating multiple streams, whether it's uh, overlapping functional parallelism if you need to do data conversion, for example. Um, for OpenMP specifically, we also introduced the, the ability to write private data into a file, which is right now 
well, without file locking, not possible, etc. So it has a couple of advantages. Um, once again, I'm not look going into all details, but I just want to point out here the application results with some of our, one of our DANAS parallel benchmarks uh, with multiple threads. What you see is basically here the execution time on two separate file systems. One is our regular PVFS2 storage, one is our SSD storage. Um, and what you see is the performance benefit of using more threads does not grow infinitely in a multi-threaded environment. But up till roughly four threads, you can see significant performance improvements in the I.O. times uh, for this benchmark, simply by taking advantage of multiple I.O. streams, et cetera, underneath the hood. Yeah. So ultimately, this also highlights, by the way, the fact that a single data stream on a large scale file system, even from within a single node, might not be able to saturate uh, a storage system. Yeah. So you might have to create more than one aggregate or process or more than one data stream from, from one node. Edgar, do you have, uh, have you looked at a comparison between one process with four threads versus four processes that are using an aggregator? Is there a difference? One process with four threads versus four processes with one aggregator. One aggregator. In other words, is, it, is, the, is the issue really that you've saturated the, the, the bandwidth um, of the file system, or is it that the, 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 the process itself just simply can't absorb it fast enough? Um, so, so that particular test we have not done, but what we have seen is that from a single node, whether it's one stream or one process, sorry, whether it's multiple threads or multiple processes, you do see similar performance advantages by having more than one stream. Now, whether we hit basically a limitation earlier on if you just have one process, that's a very good question. I don't think that we looked into that. Yeah. All right, so that's basically what I had. Um, I hope there are some, some useful aspects uh, in this talk. And um, if there are any questions, yeah, let me basically highlight that, of course, it was not just me doing the work. Um, right now, the main developers are Vishwanath Venkatsan. He does most of the work currently on OMPIO. Shitich Mehta works on the multi-threaded I.O. Carlos does, does the, the uh, shared file pointer stuff. And of course, originally, Mohammed was the main OMPIO developer. He's now at HDF5. Ketan works also on parallel I.O. for an oil company. Uh, meanwhile, and Sunit works at Dell. Uh, Reiner was actually the guy at Oak Ridge that uh, helped to supervise uh, and set up all the Ompayo stuff when, while Mohammed was there for a summer internship. So, yeah. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>